Dear friends, colleagues, partners in academia and business, my name is Castelos Colo, and it's my great honor today to welcome you as Macrofias President. Um, uh, somebody has the, the, maybe you should just mute uh, the other speakers that I, that, that we don't have interferences. So I welcome you as Macromedia's uh, president uh, and particularly our distinguished experts, some of them from abroad. Good morning, USA. <laughs> and um, um, I welcome you on behalf also of my colleagues from the Macromedia University board, Ute Masur, who is uh, also visible in this session, and Raima müller thum who will join us later as a moderator in um, the second session. Both are vice presidents at Macromedia. And um, then we have Klaus Kreulich, chair of Macromedia's Quality of Education Management Committee. Um, he is a co-host today. He is also pres vice president of Hochschule München, one of the largest public universities of applied sciences in uh, Germany. So welcome all. The COVID-19 pandemic that still overshadows um, our lives these days forced us to react, to reorganize, and at the same time also to rethink what we used to do. Today, looking back to the first corona semester, as we say in Germany, and uh, being in the middle of the second, um, there are hardly any academics or higher education managers I know of who believe that we will return to our pre-corona routines when we will be through the pandemic. And I think overall, this is good news. It's a unique opportunity to embark on a renewal of higher education. However, there are many uncertainties ahead and not every development might be beneficial for the students, for society and economy at large, but it could be so. So it was in one of the discussions in late spring with Klaus Kreulich when we paused for a moment during the ongoing task forces and ad hoc meetings and had the idea to set up a forum for rethinking higher education as encompassing as possible. Not just focusing on the way we teach, but also on how the institutions concerned with higher education will evolve or not. And what this means in um, an international perspective. It was then when we started contacting experts from employers, educators, education service providers, and education management, putting together questions we all shared somehow. Today, we are looking forward to share also some possible answers to these questions with you, dear guests. Three colleagues will moderate now in three subsequent sessions different perspectives on the future of higher education on higher education 2030, as we coined the key theme of this symposium. Merle Emre will begin with the first session on future skills and adequate um, didactics. Reimer müller thum will follow with new entrants and incumbents' roles and Tamara Rana will complete with a view on national systems and globalization. Finally, Klaus Kreulich and me, we will then try to connect the levels by wrapping up the session together with the moderators. And we shall also give an outlook on how we want to go on with the momentum we hope to build up today together with you. Between each session, there is a short break of five minutes, and you will also um, have to commute from one session to the next on the conference tool. All sessions will be recorded, and we will make them um, available for the audience after the symposium via our website. Um, the audience will also be given the opportunity to react on the um, discussions and to come up with own questions. You see a chat tool on the right side of the video streams, um, and we will hand in the questions um, to the moderators and uh, the discussions at the end uh, of each panel. So um, uh, please let us know your questions and we will try um, uh, to include them into the discussion. Now, it's my pleasure to hand over to Merle Emre. The floor is yours. Thank you. and. Um, um, we all are looking forward to inspiring insight. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? 
Yes, okay, great. Thank you very much, Kaslus Kolo. I would also like to welcome you all to this first focus session of the symposium. The subject of this session is, as you said, future skills and adequate didactics. We want to talk about which kind of skills are required from future employees and how universities see their role in here. My first speaker is Felix Kroh, and I'm very glad to have you here, Felix. I would like to introduce you briefly. Felix Kroh is a principal at the Boston Consulting Group, and he focuses on strategic HR topics, change and leadership. He defines global learning strategies and develops specific enablement programs for relevant target groups. Felix, in our preliminary talk, you said that from your point of view, the most important future skill is self-learning competence and learning has to be integrated into work. And now we are very excited to hear what your experience is. All right, great, yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to talk to you and bring in some uh, perspectives like from, from the company or the corporate world. So I understood I have five minutes to talk. So I would like to touch upon three issues. First of all, like which skills are in demand and ability to learn is definitely one of those. Then how do companies react? And also, I would like to talk a bit about a question regarding offline and online learning. Um, so starting with what skills are required. I mean, the skill question is, is quite a hot topic, right? I mean, 27% of CEOs are actually concerned about skill shortage. And also, we um, recently did a huge survey, and 61% of the people believe that their jobs will be affected by global megatrends. And interestingly, especially those people with digital expertise, they are more likely to believe that the megatrends will affect the jobs. So when we look at skills, I mean, we could start with like hard skills. And for the hard skills part, um, of course, the ongoing digital, digital transformation leads to a growing demand for digital and tech-related skills. Uh, one study we did, digital skills make 70% of growing skills that are in demand by employers, according to our analysis, with an average of uh, over 20% year over year growth. What's interesting there is that those skills are getting more and more important also in non-tech job postings, which shows to what extent those new technologies are being adopted across, across industries. And um, then, of course, so we start like the hard skills and then like tech, digital and technical skills, and then we see a mix of cognitive and interpersonal skills. And of course, this varies depending on the industry. Um, however, like the overall uh, automation trend, they will intensify different skill requirements. So it will be less dependent on manual work, but greater dependent on more like complex solving, advanced analytics, understanding data and innovations, which leads that skills in high demand uh, are related to communication, analytical skills, complex problem, problem solving, and also interacting with people, so the leadership part of it. And then, as Merle, as you were um, rightly saying, I see that another skill is getting more and more important, which is actually the ability to learn, right? Because we often we didn't learn how to learn. We are not really reflected about how to learn, what kind of learner type. And in those very transformative times, also as a company, I understand I cannot plan all the learning taking place very centrally. Of course, I can do this for very strategic stuff, but the world is changing at such a speed that we need to enable the organizations to learn. We need to enable our employees to learn, and therefore, the ability to learn is getting more and more uh, important. So, how do companies address? Uh, the question of like, reskilling, upskilling. So, the upskilling is new skills for current positions, reskilling and picking up new skills for different jobs. Um, they do a lot of analytical work, like strategic workforce planning, complemented by skill mapping. So, what job families within our company uh, will change the most? Um, how do specific skills um, change? And here it's really important to put the focus on the key skills. You need to avoid like, a top down approach, but really understand what are the key skills that are very important for us. 
that analyze you know, what top companies need to have, what kind of expertise regarding to them. Then we see companies launching the program. And what's interesting here are two things. First of all, it's a shift from individual learning to cohort-based learning, because we're talking like about the mass of people, right? It's not just individual, but it's a group of people that need to learn. So it's really cohort-based learning programs that companies are starting. And it's about grounding the learning in the actual work. So some companies collaborating with Udacity, by example, for like digital skills, because you know, you learn by applying the skills. It's very important, especially when we talk about adult learning, because then we all know, you know learning needs to be relevant. So what we also perceive is that companies try to engage more and more in driving the learning culture and fostering new ways of learning. So it's about enabling employees to learn, it's about leveraging uh, like nudges, mobile mm -hmm. learning, augmented reality, micro learning, really bite sized learning. Um, it's about uh, flexible, more flexible career paths. Um, and a lot of more taking place in the terms of like the learning culture, really making learning a habit and also uh, allowing for team learning to happen. And um, what's interesting there, there, let me have a look about more like what are the formats? Because in the past, there was this, this classical difference. So we have digital learning, which is, you know, I have to learn knowledge. So I go to like a digital class, but when it's about skill application or soft skills, you know, I will go to a classroom setting. And what I perceive in the market is that there's this ongoing shift towards digital, which was accelerated by Corona, like many other digital working modes. And, um, the Corona experience, from my point of view, is interesting. It, it really proved what is possible in terms of digital working and digital learning, which leads to the fact that also um, learning topics um, or learning programs that in the past would have been considered classical classroom topics, you know, now people understand they can also be delivered in a digital way. And digital way, of course, has some advantages in terms of scalability, it allows for better integration of work, uh, of learning into the workflow and allow um, this approach of bite-sized learning. So learning as you go and when you need it. And so I think that after some initial hesitation, uh, organizations understood that we need to think of digital learning really as a, a single format in its own, you know. You know, we really need to think what's uh, possible with that and how to also like go come up with different different parameters, how to design the learning experience that I, I think it's a sustained uh, shift towards digital learning performance. I hope this was not much longer than five minutes. <laughs> no, it was great. Exactly five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, you said that these uh, technical skills uh, get more and more important, but you also said that the most digital skills are a matter of attitude. What, yeah. do, you, what do you mean? I mean, by that I mean it's, it's um, things about customer orientation, it's about more entrepreneurial thinking, it's about, um, you know, engaging with complex problems and collaborating also across different functions, so like, also like interpersonal skills about how do I how do I engage with uh, people within my organization, people from other functions? How can we collaborate in a very good way, efficient way? Is gaining more and more um, uh, important. And of course, it's also the part of unlearning and relearning skills. You know, I think that's also a very important part of the digital part, besides the hard skills that you will need uh, to perform in a specific uh, job family or specific uh, position you have. Uh, within a company. Yes. It's actually, that, I, I have my sound quality is low. So is it better now or should I turn off the, the camera? That's good. Okay, sorry for the problems. No, I think this is, is good now. And you also spoke of those uh, job families, uh, digital yeah. job families. So can you tell us more about that? Well, it's like the question that you're having, like on the one hand, like job family is some sort of grouping in a company, right? You have positions which share, share some similarities. You want to group them to have like a strategic element to plan for. And on the one hand, of course, you need to ask yourself, how do existing um, job families need to change and take up more digital approaches? But then, of course, it's also about does digitization change 
in terms of we need totally different people. So it can be more like online marketeers, it could be like ecosystem designers, it could be like the importance of um, customer experience design, which is getting more and more important. It's about machine learning and data data analysts, really like new positions in the company that are required to, to make the most out of new technologies for the customers of the organization. Of course, they have a new recruit, they have a different like recruitment need, right? Because those are typically people you don't have within a company. So I'm currently having a discussion with the payer organization and we're also discussing about like what job families do we need? And we found out, you know, the, the business is going to change and uh, competitors are changing and we need to really uh, ask ourselves, can we continue our old habits of working or do we need to approach, uh, engage into new approaches and then where do we find those talents? And the, then the question of course always is, can we buy the talent in terms of recruiting or can we upskill the exi existing staff that we have or can we also have some sort of mix like bring in some temp workers for some uh, point of time but um, not just like borrowing those workers, but use those those temporary workers to act as multipliers and um, create the learning experience for the former and all the employees to learn by doing, right? To ground the learning in the actual doing of your work. And, and you said, and I think that's very interesting that the job descriptions are compared a lot and that there is a big benchmark yeah. between the companies. Yeah, that's, that's, that's some of the, the approaches that we are doing like with companies. And you know, when, we, when you have to find some, some specific um, uh, job families in scope, you think as a company, they're very strategically relevant for us. And we, we expect a lot of change that we applied like data analytics in terms of analyzing all the different job postings that are out there. <laughs> and then you, 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 know, you build a score. How do the skills that, are, that you can find in those job postings. How are they going to change over time? So on the one hand, of course, you get more like the, the qualitative insights and what skills are required, but you also get a sense about how, how, how dynamic are specific job positions changing? Because for some, for some jobs, you know, it's, it might be a new job also, like especially in, in, in IT. Um, but if you have a look about what, what is required from those people, you know, now they need to learn or they need to bring in the expertise totally different than just five years ago because the world is turning quickly and this helps us to en to engage um into into like uh yeah fruitful discussions with our clients you know bring like a data-based approach how is the world changing and where do we have some skill gaps and uh, because of course the future is uncertain so we need to come up with like hypothesis we need to come up with observations and usually you complement those outside in anal analysis with more like um, expert um, perspectives to bring them in, like, you know, to classify those insights and discuss with the client what is actually are the implications for the company at hand. Yeah, but we, we build those inter similarity scores to understand how is the job profiles of specific uh, job postings going to change. Yes. Okay, thank you, Felix, for the insights into the company's view of the future skills of young. Okay. And now we come to the question of what role the universities can and should play in this. And I would like to introduce Beate Baltes from Richard W. Riley College of Education and Leadership at Walden University. Nice to have you here, Beate. Good morning. Um, you are you are now joining us from um, LA and it's very early, right? Yep. It's Beate still Baltes <laughs> <laughs> has lots of experience in higher education, teaching and service and is specialized in e-learning and online teaching pedagogy. You said that uh, from your point of view, the most important future skill is grit. And I think this is a very appropriate term, even in German, without any translation. Please tell us why you think grit is so important and how can universities promote this? Yeah, so um, welcome to my world of online speaking, online meetings, online teaching. It's fun, isn't it? So um, 
Well, we've only been given five minutes, so I get right on it. What I wanted to say of about what we what I think will be the future of higher education. So if you compare us to regular businesses, they become interrupted on a regular basis. Apple invents a cell phone and makes other phones obsolete. Amazon takes shopping out of stores. Video streaming interrupts cable television and all these innovations that come out regularly. But in higher education, there hasn't changed anything that drastically in the last century. We still have classes, we still have lecture halls, and of course we experiment in higher education, right? We try smaller class sizes, we uh, build links to praxis, we train professors that are true content experts to also be good teachers, and of course we infuse technology with hundreds and hundreds of PowerPoint slides. So yeah, universities have improved, universities have changed, but really very slightly if you think about it and compare it to, to the real business world. So in the United States, there are many online universities. Some are really, really big universities. And essentially every other university already had an online campus or online offerings. So when distance learning started, it wasn't because that um, people were convinced that online learning is superior to face to face instructions. It was really more of a necessity. All of my graduate students, I work for a, one of the biggest online universities and almost all of my graduate students are working adults with families and they just don't have the luxury to quit their job and go to school and drive to campus. It's just not an option. Another example is my brother, actually, when he um, when it was just founded, he attended the Uni Fern Universität Hagen because he was in the German Olympic team. He had to live on some Olympic Stützpunkt in the middle of nowhere, and his training schedule would have never been able to coordinate with class schedules, even if there would have been a university around. And there are plenty of other examples, well, but what I'm trying to say here it wasn't that people thought, ooh, distance learning is the way to go. It's so much better than face-to-face. -face. It really is, for some, it's a, a convenience. And for some, or for many, it's really the only chance to go to higher, to continue their education at all. And so they didn't consider it better, but they, I mean, at least my students consider it just as good as brick and mortar universities. And then the education market was actually interrupted in March and a major interruption in higher education as well as all other levels of education. I'm in California and my son hasn't been to school in nine months. So other than online schooling, right? But the schools here are still completely shut down. So in a panic in March, everybody panicked and everybody went, on went online and lo and behold, now we learn two things. First of all, the way we used to educate is not the only way, which we assumed it is. And we also learned that other forms like online learning actually does work and is actually doable. And because of that experience, what I predict, and I admit maybe it's just wishful thinking actually, but I hope or I predict that the focus will be no longer on how and where we teach, but the focus will be on how students learn. How do we engage the students in their learning and how they learn, how do we make sure they learn what they actually need to know? And that's exactly what my colleague Felix here just discussed. For example, one of the topics being learn how to learn. So now the question is, how do we go about it? Well, we first have to evaluate what we're doing in academia. What is actually the educational value of what we used to do before the pandemic? So in the last couple of months, a lot of professors learned that their, let's call it somewhat boring lectures, aren't becoming more mesmerizing when you watch them as a video at home. So we have to ask ourselves, what really is the educational value of, of lectures and what we did in the past? So faculty will have to step it up here. We have to reimagine how to get students to learn and think about what we should really have them learn. And maybe some part will be through on online learning or through virtual reality. 
Maybe faculty will have to leave their cozy ivory tower and engage with students in experiments or experiences outside of the university. Maybe higher education will be a much more inclusive environment. Maybe faculty invent some creative and innovative new learning approaches that none of us here have any idea yet, or maybe one of us is going to be the next great inventor. Maybe faculty will have to talk to businesses on what they need our graduates to actually be able to do. And maybe, and I actually hope that this will be the case, is like other traits are becoming more important. And as Marilee already said, I believe that maybe grit and self-motivation, self-reliance, that these are becoming key competencies. During the pandemic, we also learned that not everybody can work from home and a lot of people can work from home and maybe that will be the new normal. So then we really have to figure out what does it take for somebody to actually do this? So um, since my five minutes yes. are about up, yeah. the, key ta <laughs> oh, yeah. so the key takeaways um, for me is that I hope we do I hope that we are not only not returning just back to our old methods of teaching the way we used to do it, that but we that we really focus on the learner and the skills that students will need. And again, going above academic subjects like grit, grit maybe developing a passion for what you do, integrity, autonomy, or as Felix said, learn to learn. There are plenty of other competencies that aren't really part of our standard curriculum. And I think um, before we revamp higher education that we think about that. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and so you said there is uh, a key in how we get the students into this active learning way. And um, some say that in this online learning, it is very hard to, to um, get them involved. And what's your experience? How well, can uh, we do it? <laughs> I have to question that. I have to question that so much because I've been involved in online learning and online learning pedagogy for for decades, actually. So even when I was still at, a, at a California, at the University of California at the brick and mortar institution, I developed actually the first teacher credential program online, the first online teacher credential program in California. And what we learned is that you don't have a class with, you know, X number of students and from the X number of students, five actually physically interact with you and talk to you and answer questions while the rest sits there and doesn't move. No, in an online classroom, especially if it's asynchronous, everybody interacts, everybody talks. So you by default have everybody involved. And so the shocking news was not that now students are actively involved. The shocking news is that the professor is now working 10 times as much, right? So for us, the faculty, this is a lot of work. <laughs> I mean, we love it, but but still, it's a lot more work and, and there are parameters that we need to consider smaller class sizes because otherwise you just really can't handle all, all these students who suddenly have an opinion, who suddenly do interact with you that, and they interact with each other as well. It's not just a, the regular one-way professor-student situation. Now the students are interacting constantly which again is great and it improves learning and they share their experiences which is all fantastic but it just which is what we want but but we also want to say you see the gray hair here that's what comes out of online learning that's all i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you very much beate and um, the the hard work how to teach and how can universities do this is a good keyword to pass on to the next speaker so, our next speaker is Peter Dürr from, from the Hochschule München. He is a professor of knowledge and communication management and his research and teaching focuses on scientific methods and knowledge exploration and transfer and the design of learning processes. Peter, you said that the most important future skill is the ability to take responsibility. So, but how can we teach this to our students? 
So thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, first, I need to make a change to the dramaturgy because um, actually I didn't follow any of the open instructions and I did prepare a presentation. I'm a very visual communicator. So please allow me to um, to share some slides with you that um, follow all the criteria you re recommended not to integrate into open presentations. But there are just some points I want to make here. Okay, give me just some seconds to find the document. Okay. Can you see the presentation? Yes, now it's visible. So can you yeah. see it in presentation mode? Yes, I can. Okay, lucky you. Okay, so let me just... Um, I'm going to try to focus on some aspects which are uh, which haven't been um, said by other people. I actually don't think um, that the digital is the real game changer in here. So when we talk about future education, um, the, the digital or the technological aspect is just one dimension among many others that also um, Beate Baltes just uh, pointed to. And I just try to explicate what we're really talking about. So one question that I think we always need to push forward is we need to think about um, what is actually um, the outcome that is desirable for us and not just look at the employability and the economy, but we also need, I'd love to focus on um, educating people to become um, um, responsible citizens and not electing the wrong political leaders. And we also need to look at the personal development of the individual that we're educating. So the other question and that you just uh, mentioned, I think um, what's actually in terms of content, what we need to teach is very much crossing borders in terms of transdisciplinary approaches and uh, teaching in the arena of sustainability, which is uh, the most important topic of our time. What I want to focus on uh, today, though, is what is actually the method? What is the way that people learn and actually both um, Felix Co and Beate Baltes mentioned learning how to learn. I think we need to um, think about what are the mechanisms by which learning work. And I want to just say some words about the design of learning processes here. So in the center, of course, it's got to be the learner and not the ivory tower professor. Um, and I think there are three different kinds of um, um, design dimensions which we can control as instructors and one in my sense um, often disregarded aspect is not just um, the social interaction but it's also about how do we actually engage them cognitively how are they engaged what is the the learning activity that any student at any time is engaged in and I think we have massive problems uh, the way most of our instructions are designed today the second is uh, the social interaction and actually in this context it uh, is less important whether we're communicating through a computer screen or a telephone or face to face in terms of possible social interactions um, we see of course the uh, the restrictions any kind of um, platform puts in this but it's not the central aspect and the third aspect because we always talk about the virtual space any one of you and i'm standing in a physical space and these physical spaces will not disappear just because we're communicating through a digital platform. Peter, one, and, s um, one second. Yes. Uh, um, I think we only see the first page, still the first page. Oh, that's but, quite boring. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is um, technology does matter. So you can't see all the beautiful slides I've produced for you. I think it's not the presentation mode. Okay, so let's do a short check on how this should work. I did some screen sharing here and you're just looking at my first page. Sometimes my student tell me on the on after one hour, actually, we can't see anything of what you're referring to. So thank you for intervening in time. Maybe I'll just share the entire screen and then you should see what I see. How about now? Yeah. Okay, this is the third. I'm sorry, thank you for reminding me. So uh, let me just repeat the key points here. I think learning is about the kind of cognitive interaction, the kind of physical spatial interaction about the social interaction. 
And when we talk about the, the game change of the digital, I think we disregard the important aspects of what is actually happening through the interaction with other people or the interaction with content in a given space. And all of us are actually in physical spaces. We are communicating um, from one physical space into another. We're not really, uh, most of the time, spending time in the, in the virtual space. So what are the principal learning activities? There are three groups. One is people and any student, they have to learn to generate hypotheses. You generate hypotheses by acquiring information, trying to understand this information and uh, making a synthesis. A second approach to learning is testing hypotheses, which is about building something, writing something, presenting it and looking at the results and uh, gathering the feedback actually this gathering feedback is one of the bottlenecks in any kind of educational setup. And finally, students need to learn um, to create the right application context. And this is where I see a relationship to what Felix Crow said before. We're differentiating the modes of working and thinking in universities and in businesses, but actually these two modes are merging. And businesses are very happy when the brains get more blood, but they want to see results. So we need to look at the mechanism of application and implementation of solutions. And if you look at these nine different, what I call the key learning activities or um, cognitive engagements, you have the arena uh, that actually sets the stage of what should happen in any kind of class. Keep this picture in mind for um, one minute because I'm adding a second dimension to this that we need to look at the social interaction. And of course, this is something that most of the students and us as instructors miss right now. We actually miss the uh, interacting in space and feeling the energy and bumping into someone and having all the awful smell of people uh, not taking showers. And we interact in space, but the social interaction varies very much between a lecture setup, a seminar setup, a teamwork setup, or any kind of setup that includes um, using virtual interfaces. So we need to understand in any kind of um, social interaction, we involve different spaces and that changes the interaction. And if we summarize these um, six typical setups, then we get descriptions of different modes of social interaction. Now, these we need to piece together. And this is what I call um, building a learning parkour, customizing it for the specific uh, content that you, want to, um, that you want to convey and look at how are students actually using their brain in the process, what is the social interaction look like um, in order to get the best out of a, a learning process. I just give two examples, then I'm done. If you look at a typical lecture, this is the path you take. The professor says, today we're going to talk about geometric functions, and then he goes blah blah, and he writes up the chalkboard, or he puts up the 100 PowerPoint slides. At some point, um, the, the student needs to regurgitate it in, in an exam, and then he'll get a, a, a C minus, right? And most of the time, they're just sitting there passively and, and sourcing, right? Getting up information. All the kind of analyses or syntheses are not performed by students, they're performed by the professor. And if we look at the social interaction, you see a lot of blue because it's me talking and you listening. And an opposite um, design setup is one we use at the University of Applied Sciences in Munich. We call it real projects. And we want to make sure that all students engage differently with what they're learning. So there has to be some creating processes, some sourcing, analyzing, understanding, making syntheses, going back. So this is actually the gist of what I want to say. Good learning has two uh, important components. Actually, it's three. One important component, engage differently uh, with your brain, different cognitive engagements. Second, change the kind of social interaction. And the third, iterate, iterate, iterate. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. I think it's very interesting, maybe only one question because of the time. Um, it's a big a point how our society defines success of education. And you, is it just employability? And you just said that it's more individual. 
and there is a different engagement. Um, what do you think? Well, I hold it with Socrates, who actually said the moment uh, education gets useful, it's no education anymore. It's something different. Um, I, I wouldn't go that far. I think it has to go hand in hand, but it would be very, um, it would be a pity if we thought, well, we can create some people that you can employ and we will create other people who fix the world. I think we need to integrate that. And definitely we do have um, several problems facing us today that um, require a different kind of thinking, a different kind of perception of the problem, a different attitude. And I think you can aid it through a transdisciplinary approach. I work in a social science department, so we have the engineers screw up the world and uh, the, the economists um, writing the business plan for it. And then, you know, we sort of help the people who drop out of the system. And I think this kind of uh, working engagement is not one of the future. We need to actually confront each other during the education, not only in the real, real world setup afterwards, during education with these different aspects. Thank you very much for this speech. And Thank you. now we will hear our last speaker in this session one, which is Jonathan Sieg. Welcome, Jonathan. We are Thank very you. glad to have you here. Um, let me introduce you with some words. Um, Jonathan is a multiple founder. Among other companies, he founded the virtual reality corporate learning company von Morgan. And he is an author, a lecturer, and he gives seminars and keynotes on the topics, effective learning strategies, personal development, and confident time management. And Jonathan, you said that the most important future skills from your point of view are concentration and focus. Please tell us why and what, um, how we are technology can benefit universities. Thank you so much, Merle. It's a great pleasure to be part of this panel. And I would like to start with a personal story of how the country of Myanmar has transformed their entire education system with the help of virtual reality and augmented reality, because my part of this session is to cover how new technologies can improve our learning processes. And I focused on that for the past few years. And I met an incredible, incredibly inspiring female entrepreneur from Myanmar at a event at Singularity University in California. And she told me about her work in the field of education with new technologies in her country. And I went to high school in South Africa and I know how bleak the education system can look like in developing countries. And it was just truly inspiring and remarkable to see what she did in Myanmar when I visited her. She managed to grow her team to over 80 developers in less than two years. And their applications that they are building, they're mandatory in high schools and universities now. And what they do is they train language learning through virtual reality. They do life and natural sciences with augmented reality. And they build university programs with both technologies and all students run through it. And for me, it was great to see that because there are two main benefits for this approach. And the first one is linked to the future skill that, that I shared, which I think is very, very important. That is concentration and focus. When you use virtual reality, you're definitely way less distracted while you learn. And it is also very visual. So in German, we would say it's gehirngerecht. That means that we learn something, we get a visual input, and at the same time, we get a logical approach and we can combine them, which means that it makes the information stick. And especially in the field of language learning and also history and geography, the applications have a huge impact on the learner because students, for example, who've never traveled, and in Myanmar, a lot of students have never traveled, they get the opportunity to gain new perspectives, new insights from all across the globe through her work. They have a partnership with Singularity University, for example, and students in Myanmar can join the sessions at Singularity University and learn from there experiences. And what we did in Germany is, is similar work in the German speaking region. We also did it in the United States, but we focused a bit more on skills development. We also focused on the so-called soft skills, which I think are not that soft anymore, looking at the whole future skills debate. Um, but we only did our virtual reality applications mainly up until the corona pandemic hit in March, which is quite interesting because 
most of my friends, friends and fellow entrepreneurs, they all said, well, congrats. I heard digital is going through the roof and your business must be blossoming. But in fact, the opposite was the case because the deployment of virtual reality is still at an infile stage. It's still at an early stage. It's, it's, it's quite hard. And also the hygiene regulations at many companies became a major problem for us. However, the benefits of the technology are still there. And I would like to close with sharing how I believe or what I would do if I were to build and recommend a case for a university like yours. The thing that I would definitely do is build a virtual field trip to the most innovative, most interesting companies across the globe so that all students can gain firsthand insights from inspiring people from different new work concepts like working agile all these things that are now taught in theory everywhere nowadays but the real link to the applications and how it is used how it looks like in a day-to-day -day business that is still often missing and i believe that could be one of many great ways for universities to combine learning with new technologies and make the learning more exciting more interesting meet amazing people and be able to gain new perspectives Yes, thanks for this interesting speech. And you said that in the preliminary um, talk that some clarification is needed. What qualities the uh, young talents um, must have? So what is the point which has to be clarified? <laughs> so. I must admit that I don't quite remember making that statement, but I think it is crucial, like looking at um, what skills are required, like the ones that my colleagues here just shared, and then building on top of that, like actual qualifications, actual um, degrees. Like, for example, I, I talked to you a lot about concentration focus as a core skill that then most other skills can be built on top of because we as especially younger people but but most people these days as those of you who have seen the social dilemma for example um saw we are so distracted there's so many things happening we are so instant gratification um shaped and 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 triggered that we don't manage to focus on the thing at hand and i think no matter what we want to learn in life if we don't get that one thing straight and Cal Newport has written amazing books about it, then we won't be able to learn any important skill in depth and, and, and become really good at our craft. Okay. And you said that the virtual reality can help to focus because there's not so much distraction anymore. And so the students at our universities can uh, learn and applicate the things they learn from theory. Yeah, I mean, it's a paradox because we say we take a new technology to help um, deal with existing technologies. But I always joked and I said, well, we force people that they that they need to focus, that they concentrate because we can show them whichever world we want and we can make them interact with that world. And they are not able to do anything else in that world. They can't check their smartphone. They can't check their email. And there's been so many questions from companies who said, hey, can you build in our email system into it? Can we have our desktop in it? And I said, no, that's not the point. If you go into that world, we want you to focus. We want you to interact. We want you to be fully present because that is one of the core things that real learning with a great output requires. Yes, thank you. Maybe um, we as universities should think about that. Yes. Thanks and um, thank you for all your inputs and speeches. And now it is time to um, hand over to the next session, which is session two, and it's called new entrants and incumbents roles. And thank you, Merle. Thank you all. And now we have to click much. on this session on the left hand side.